This is Bob Oliphant from the Westford Historical Society and Museum, bringing you Episode 20 of Season 2 of the Westford Wardsman Podcast. The Westford Wardsman newspaper was part of Turner's Public Spirit, a weekly newspaper in air a century ago. In this episode, we'll be reading the Wardsman for the week ending Saturday, May 15th, 1909. I'll elaborate on what was happening in Westford 115 years ago as we read. The first item in uh, the May 15th issue was about town. At the adjourned meeting of the first published Unitarian, uh, of the first parish Unitarian church held in the parlors of the church last Saturday evening, the meeting was called to order by a Bile J. Abbott, clerk of the parish. Edward Fisher was elected moderator, after which the following persons were elected for the coming year. Clerk, uh, a Bile J. Abbott, collector, William William, his full name is William Henry Harrison Burbeck, treasurer, uh, C. O. Prescott, assessors, assessors H. V. Hildreth, W. H. H. Burbeck, and Edward Fisher, prudential committee, A. J. Abbott, Edward Fisher, and Clara Fisher, music committee, Mrs. Julia Fletcher, Eva Fletcher, and Ruth Fisher, committee on church lot, Captain uh, Sherman H. Fletcher, W. H. Burbeck. Auditor H. V. Hildreth, Church Historian Miss Emily F. Fletcher. The Treasurer's report showed that receipts and expenditures for the year had balanced, and this old, ancient first parish of Westford is still able to maintain a loyal conservatism and quote hold fast that which is good end quote. And that's another uh, one of Samuel Taylor's biblical references. This one to First Thessalonians, chapter five, verse twenty-one. John Perkins, who has been living of late in the cottage on the Lowell Road, owned by J. H. Decatur, is making preparations to move into the true A. Bean Cottage at Westford Center. John A. Taylor graduated from the Emerson School of Oratory last Thursday in Boston and was selected to give the class oration. Uh, He was the proud, he was the the son of... uh, the author here, Samuel L. Taylor. The assessors give notice that they will hold regular monthly meetings the first Wednesday evenings of each month, at which time those who think they are taxed too little and others too much can come and be adjusted. The program for Memorial Day is nearly completed, which will include an address by the Honorable Herbert E. Fletcher, reading by John A. Taylor, singing by a quartet from Lowell, music by the Nashua Military Band, dinner in the lower hall after the exercises, band concert on the common from 2 to 4 p.m. At the regular meeting of the selectmen, May 1st, Samuel L. Taylor was appointed a member of the Board of Registration of Voters in place of Quincy W. Day, who declined a reappointment after many years of faithful service. Amos Poley has just finished planting 30 bushels of potatoes, which is good for $1,000 income, and to increase the income still more, he is now busy sowing an acre of peppers and one half acre of beets. It beats all in all senses what smart business he is. The next meeting of the Fortnightly Club will be held at the Wright Schoolhouse Friday evening, May 28th. The Fortnightly Club was a Northwestford club in the schoolhouse is on, or was on uh, Groton Road in uh, North Chelmsford, near near the uh, near where North Street comes into Groton Road. A wide awake program to keep sleepy folks awake is what you can come prepared to take. Come and be a taker. The county convention of the WCTU will be held at the Congregational Church Thursday, May 20th. The program is grand enough to make you, quote, lift up your eyes unto the fields, for they are already white unto the harvest. Uh, That's a quote from John chapter 4, verse 35. On On and after May 17th, the rates of fare on the branch line, Brookside to Westford Center, will be as follows. Brookside to Westford Center, or reverse, 15 cents. Brookside to Junction of Lowell Road and Westford Road, or reverse, 8 cents. Junction of Lowell Road and Westford Road to Westford Center, or reverse, 8 cents. Next is a long uh, 
paragraph on the school superintendent's salary. At a recent meeting of the school committee of Acton, Littleton, and Westford, being the towns comprised and forming a district employing a superintendent of schools, Arthur B. Weber was unanimously re-elected superintendent with an increase in salary of $100. Of this extra, Westford will contribute one half, but just where this extra compensation is coming from is not clear. At the annual town meeting, the school committee recommended the same salary, $800, as the allotment of Westford. The finance committee recommended the same sum, and the town unanimously voted it. Now the question really is, have have the school committee a right to rescind a vote of the town that the school committee unanimously favored? The school committee have written an appeal to the finance committee stating that they shall look to the finance committee and selectmen to secure this money. The finance committee reply in substance that their duties are confined to reviewing the needs of the different departments of the town and recommending to the voters of the town what in the judgment of the finance committee is necessary for each department and they have no more authority to vote the sum they recommended than the ordinary voter and the selectmen can only order out of the treasury what the voters ordered in and the voters only ordered eight hundred dollars for the salary of superintendent of schools now how are you going to order out eight hundred and fifty dollars It can't come out of the general school appropriation, for that is all spoken for before it even gets into the taxpayer's possession. It seems to be a case of can't and shortage. Although the amount involved is in some of its bearings dangerously small, yet let it teach thee in the future before you leap to give a try at know-it-all. Uh, Samuel Taylor is one to keep a keen eye on the town budget, if, if you haven't noticed that yet. The next section is the Westford Center section. The many friends of Edwin N.C. Barnes, supervisor of music in the schools, will be interested to know that he is to be married on July 8th to Miss Mabel M. Crocker of Braintree. Mr. Barnes will take his bride abroad where he will study with Study, where he will study until reopening of his studio, Symphony Chambers, in Boston in September. The Thimble Club met with Mrs. Charles L. Hildreth Thursday afternoon of last week with every member in attendance. Miss Esther Gardner-Fisher, daughter of Edward and Helen I. Gardner-Fisher, was admitted into membership. The Donald Camerons, who have spent the winter in Lowell, are at the Westford Homestead for the summer. Mrs. Calvert and Mrs. Barnard are also established here for the summer. Mr. and Mrs. William Pollock on Cold Spring Road have recently welcomed a third child, a daughter, Ruth E. Pollock, born May 4th, into their home. A good series of pictures from the Library Art Club entitled Raphael in the Vatican are on exhibition at the library. Workmen are busy under the direction of the selectmen clearing up the lot between the academy and the William E. Frost School. They are trying to make the, not the academy they're, speak, they're speaking of, of course, is the, what we know as the Rodenbush Community Center building. They are trying to make the $100, the sum voted for this purpose at the town meeting, go as far as it will. But with so many rocks, big and little, in an old wall and scattered about, and some gnarled old apple trees to be cut and ditches to fill in, the sum is not going to be adequate. But the residents are glad of so much improvement, for since the completion of the schoolhouse, it has been an unsightly clutter hole. Uh, This is the beginning of what would become Whitney Playground, and we'll certainly read more about that later, and how it got its name Whitney in particular. Fletcher and Needham of Littleton are to build for Mrs. Mary E. Fletcher a pretty and comfortable dwelling for herself and daughter. It is to have the modern improvements and work is to be started very soon with the plan of getting ready to move in before cold weather. Mrs. Fletcher thoroughly investigated the opportunities of buying or renting before undertaking to build, but found the latter course the best. Mother's Day was fittingly observed at the Congregational Church Sunday. This is a new and beautiful observance in the church calendar. Its object is to honor, quote, the best mother that ever lived, hyphen, your mother, end quote. 
The time planned for this day is the second Sunday in May, and the badge is a white flower, preferably a white carnation. A large bunch of these flowers ornamented the pulpit Sunday, and there were other beautiful spring flowers. There was a specially arranged service at the Sunday school hour conducted by the superintendent, Mr. Osgood, and the same thought was carried out at the evening service. Mother's Day was originated not long before this by Anna Jarvis of Philadelphia on May 12, 1907, when she held a, mem a memorial service at her mother's late church in Grafton, West Virginia. Within five years, virtually every state was observing the day, and in 1914, President Woodrow Wilson made it a national holiday. Jarvis had promoted the wearing of a white carnation as a tribute to one's mother, but the custom soon developed of wearing a red or pink carnation to represent a living mother or a white carnation for a mother who was deceased. And now I guess that custom has gone away all, almost all, almost completely. The next section is called Club Guest Night. The annual Gentlemen's or Guest Night given by the members of the Tadmuck Club proved a most successful and enjoyable occasion. It took place at the Congregational Church Tuesday evening with about 150 people in, att in attendance. The church was prettily trimmed with palms, ferns, and early spring flowers. The entertainment consisted of dr dramatic readings by Mrs. Carolyn Foy Flanders of Boston and music by Miss Eva Young of London, England, who was Mrs. Helen K. Frost's guest. Mrs. Flanders, who won the appreciation of all who heard her at the Grange course in the winter, fully sustained the happy impression made by her at that time. Mrs. Flanders possesses the quick charm and versatility that wins an audience to sympathetic appreciation of her capable efforts. She gave a varied program of 12 numbers, all of which were much enjoyed, particularly her work in monologue and the dainty, graceful impersonation taken from Madame Butterfly, which was particularly skillful. Miss Young is a talented pianist, and her playing Tuesday evening was very genu genuinely appreciated. Following is the program, piano solos, pastoral, en courant, Miss Young, monologues, unexpected guests, the morning veil, Ann Miller's cat, Mrs. Flanders, piano solos, study, la his own, his, his own pre, Miss Young read. Readings, Mrs. Puff, Puff, Mrs. Puffer's Silver Wedding, The Sales Lady, How the Professor Propo Proposed, Mrs. Flanders, Piano Solo, Polonaise, Miss Young. Miss Sarah Whitney Loker, the club's president, presided over this part of the evening's formal program with her usual efficiency, after which the gathering adjourned to the vestry and refreshments of delicious ice cream and cake were served and general sociability enjoyed, after which the gathering broke up and the fourth season of work and pleasure of this organization, that is the Tadmont Club, passed into history. The next section is the Westford Grange sh section. At the Grange last week, Thursday evening, there was a good attendance. The faithful secretary, Mrs. Frank C. Wright, was absent from her chair, detained at home with sickness. In several years of service in this capacity, this is almost her only absence. The ladies' degree staff voted to accept the invitation of Concord Grange to go there the first meeting in June and confer the third degree. The subject for the evening was, quote, some troublesome pests and how to deal with them, to what extent is the orchard crop increased by spraying, end quote. Henry B. Reed opened the discussion with a well-written paper. As an extensive or orchardist and a graduate of Amherst Agricultural College, this paper was valuable to his hearers. It was followed by, by general discussion. There were selections by the Grange Orchestra, reading by Horace E. Gould, and a solo by John S. Grieg. The next section is Graniteville. The Brookside Mills Baseball Club visited here on last Saturday afternoon and met with defeat at the hands of the C.G. Sargent team to the tune of 20 to 13. The game was replete with heavy hitting on both sides and proved to be very interesting in spite of the one-sided score. 
Many errors were made by both sides, which kept the large crowd guessing as to the final outcome. At the end of the seventh inning, only one run separated the two teams, but the locals came back strong in the eighth, scoring nine runs by strong batting and putting the game on ice. The game was well attended, the fair sex being out in force. Umpire Henry, Henry, I'm sorry, umpire Harry Hartford of Westford. The funeral of Joseph Talamini, the Italian who was found drowned in the canal in Fort's village on last Saturday morning, took place from the rooms of Undertaker J.A. Healy in this village on Sunday afternoon at one o'clock. You may recall that they, they, uh, drained the canal looking for his body, as was mentioned in the wardsman two weeks ago, but, and didn't find it, but apparently they did find it on the following sa last Saturday. His sister came from Newark, New Jersey, and took charge of the body. Burial was in a lot set apart in St. Catherine's Cemetery. The bearers were Joseph Riney, Edward Riney, D.W. Herring, Herring, and R.J. Heyman. The Ladies' Aid Society of the Methodist Episcopal Church met with Mrs. Wesley O. Hawks on last Thursday afternoon. T.E. Freeman of Lexington, a former principal of Sargent School, has been a recent visitor in this village. The members of the A.R. Schott Hose Company No. 2 were out of practice duty on last Tuesday evening and tried the pressure of several of the hydrants. The next section is the Forge Village section. Miss Florence Wadley was pleasantly surprised at home Saturday evening by a large number of her friends who called upon her and presented her with a valuable gold locket. Lillian Hunt, a little miss of five years, prettily dressed in blue silk muslin, made the presentation speech and gave the present into the hands of Miss Florence. Although very much surprised, she thanked the kind friends in a few well-chosen words. The usual games were played, then a fine musical program. Refreshments were served, Miss Sweat assisting Mrs. Wadley in serving. Word has been received here from Mr. and Mrs. John Pulsifer, who left early in April for Lindsay, California. Mr. Pulsifer writes that the haying season is just over. They intend to settle there. Mrs. John Edwards, who has been very sick for the last two weeks, can now set up for a few, mi few minutes each day. Next is a, a fairly lengthy obituary. Mrs. Sarah Prescott Lawrence, widow of the late David P. Lawrence, died at her late home on 62 Pleasant Street Monday morning at the advanced age of 95 years, 8 months, and 17 days. She leaves to mourn her loss and only daughter, Miss Grace Lawrence. Mrs. Lawrence was born in Forge Village and was one of nine children. Her parents were Captain Abram and, Will and Olive Adams Prescott. In her early life, she taught school, and for a few years, she was teacher of sewing at the city farm of Lowell. In August 1853, she married David Prescott Lawrence and resided in Lowell for some years. Then they came back to Westford Village, where they spent the remainder of their lives. Everyone who knew her was drawn to her by strong ties of affection. She was an invalid for many years, but always showed a great deal of interest in all those about her, both near and dear friends and neighbors always ready to aid those in need, both materially and sympathetically. She was a great reader and enjoyed it until a few weeks before her death. It was a pleasure to converse with her, for she was so well informed on the leading topics of the day, and more especially her religious convictions were so broad and inspiring that one went from her presence the better for having known her. Mrs. Lawrence and her daughter had lived together in that beautiful unity of spirit that made the home life very dear to them both, and for many years she had been ready for that one clear call which she would see when she would see her pilot face to face. The funeral services were held at her home Wednesday afternoon, May 12th. Reverend Mr. Moulton, formerly Unitarian minister of Westford, but now of Stowe, an old friend of the family, officiated and spoke words of comfort to the daughter and the friends. A quartet, Mrs. David Grieg, Mrs. Seavey, Mr. Boynton, and John Grieg, sang two selections, Lead, Kindly Light, and The Christian's Good Night. The, the flowers were very beautiful tokens of love and respect, 
from the relatives and neighbors, fitting emblems of the beautiful spirit of the one who was now who has now, quote, crossed the bar, end quote, and entered the beyond where many are waiting. Burial was in West Lawn Cemetery. Uh, the, the quoted phrase, crossed the bar, and the reference given above of seeing her pilot face to face are often used in obituaries of mariners where crossing the bar often uh, often found across the outlets of rivers and harbors signified leaving the safety of the harbor that's life, I guess, for the unknown of death. Both phrases are from Alfred Lord Tennyson's 1889 poem, Crossing the Bar, which she asked to have put at the end of all collections of his poems. It begins, Sunset and evening star, and one clear call for me, and may there be no moaning of the bar when I put out to sea. And that's the news in Westford for the week ending May 15th, 1909. Thank you for listening, and thanks to Nick Woodbury of Westford Cat for providing technical support. You can find transcriptions and podcasts from the Wardsman at our, West, at our website at museum.westford.org or visit the Historical Society's Facebook page for more Westford news from a century ago. This is Bob Oliphant, and I hope you will join us for next week's Westford Wardsman podcast. Thank you.